you're not supposed to, you basically put yourself at the risk of losing all your funding for that land. So I don't think you want to try to do that. Mm-hmm. When you make the legal, I bet it's something like at what price if you want to do uh, what's it called? When you the lab rap, what's it called? When you the subject? Anyway, yeah, when I'm it's like if someone like when they do make it or if they make it legal, the person they test it and I'm gonna get paid. But do you know the product? Probably a hundred million dollars worth. No, a worth. Probably because the test that she's looking at, you know, she's probably doing something on. Yeah, yeah. Put it, take me. I'm just saying, if they pay me enough money, I'll do it. Okay. All right. Uh, we're up to quit the being lab rats or whatever. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry that we're starting late, but the other class was finishing a test, and there'll still be students coming in periodically, turning those in. Did want to go over just the announcements. I think you've heard most of them before, all of these. I'll give you a couple more at the end. Remember, when, if and when you're getting ready to graduate, please apply to graduate the term before you've scheduled to graduate so you can make sure everything's in place the term before so you can get registered for everything you need that term. Note takers, as far as I know, are still needed for fall 2018. Contact Dr. Renee Herndon on this campus, Ms. Janine Jones on the Birmingham West campus. Space Center was looking for higher peer tutors in the areas of math, English, biology, computer science, and Spanish. I uh, know that was on the Birmingham campus, probably on this campus too. In addition to that, and I just walked by the lab, uh, they're for SSS program, they have tutors they hire. So please consider doing that. Now, um, just a minor adjustment to my office hours today. Um, I've got to be off campus just very briefly right around 1 o'clock. Okay, so I'm going to have to leave campus right around 12.45 and hopefully be back before 1.15. So normally I have office hours 11.15 to 1.15. Today's 11.15 to about 12.45 because uh, I've got to run off campus for something and, and just come right back. All right, and I'll tell you this again on Thursday. On Thursday, um, I'm taking my uh, class on a field trip, the, the 115 class on a field trip. So I've got to go to the Birmingham campus as soon as this class is over with and pick up a vehicle and bring it back here. So on Thursday, my office hours, I won't have any office hours until later in the day. Uh, we'll probably get back from the field trip around 4 o'clock, so after that I'll probably have office hours then. Uh, there may be a few students that still want to take the final exam that day. If so, I'll be up here, but I'll be able to see you. Final won't take them that long. All right, then next Tuesday, I told you this last week, right? Next Tuesday, I have a doctor's appointment at... Uh, did I say 10.40 or 10.20? I think it was 10.40. And so that means I have to be there at labs at 9.40. And that means I have to leave campus here about 9 o'clock. So this class is white slick by my doctor's appointment. Okay, and we talked about maybe making it up. And I came up with another thing after we left here. Um, do some of you have a class right after this one? You do. Say again. No, uh, on 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 Tuesday or Thursday. Okay. Yeah, next Friday is when we're talking about making it up, um, weren't we? Is that what we decided on? What's that? I'll be, I'll be recording the class, so if you can't come, you'll still be able to hear the class, okay? Uh, but next Friday was the best time, was that right? Or did you want to do it this Friday? Either one would work with me. Uh, you can set the time anytime between 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock would be fine with me. Actually, let's see, this Friday would not be as good as next Friday because I've got to go out of town this Friday, so next Friday would be better. Any time 
suit you better? You want it regular time or you want it earlier, later? Okay. You do or you don't? You want it. Okay. So you want to meet to meet you want to meet at eight or eight thirty? Uh nine ten o'clock like this class normally meets, you name it and claim it. I will be how long this class? Hour and fifteen minutes. Now if you wanted to, you could do a shorter one day Friday the next, but I thought, why do that? Let's just knock it out in the morning. We can still talk about it on Thursday of next week and Thursday of this week too. So do we want to talk about it next uh, well, Thursday or the following Thursday? We won't be here until Tuesday. Okay. We'll finish up. So if we think about what time on Friday you'd rather do the class, I'll be here from 8 to noon. Okay? Said not this Friday, but no. What's that? Not this Friday, but no. Yeah, let's not do it this Friday because I've got to go out of town this Friday, and so I don't want to push it into, uh, you know, being so late that it gets into the time that I need to leave. So uh, next Friday I'll have. If we need extra time, you can have it because I'll be able to stay over. All right, let me. I forgot to do this. In my first class, I forgot to mark the people who were absent. All right. I've got the four of you who are here. All right, now here's where, uh, again, I found this really bizarre. I had been teaching before from the DVD that came with the last edition. But this year I decided, well, let me go and, and because they don't send out DVDs anymore, you have to download them from the website, you know, the, the uh, PowerPoint. So I thought, well, I'll upgrade them and download from the PowerPoint. Well, I did that, and these are still just like the CD from last you know, edition. They didn't update these. Did we do this one in class? I thought we did. The fire truck leaning against the building. We did that. Okay. That was example two in the old edition. Example two in the new edition is very different. This is on page 328. So is that where we're going to pick up today? Was that? I have it marked the example two, but I knew we had already done the old edition one, but we didn't do the one in the new edition, did we? What's that? Right. Right. Okay. So let's do that. Finding the side of a right triangle. Okay, let me get my pen set up. Well, there we go. All right. The height of a mountain is 5,000 feet, okay? We have a little mountain here. Its height is 5,000 feet, okay? The distance between its peak and that of an adjacent mountain is 25,000 feet, okay? So here's the adjacent mountain over here, okay? And the distance between this mountain and that mountain peak is 25,000 feet. Now, mine is not to scale as one in the book is not to scale either, okay? Uh, the distance between its peak and that of the adjacent mountain is 25,000 feet. The angle of elevation between the two peaks is 27 degrees. So if you did a horizontal there and an angle there, this is 27 degrees. Now that's probably not to scale either. Okay. What is the height of the adjacent mountain? Okay. How in the world can you do that? What would be your approach? You want to know the height of this mountain. I 
how would you do it? By the way, your ebook has the this one and it does not. Okay. PowerPoint don't print that. How would you do it? You were starting to say something. I don't know. We have the the adjacent side. Okay. Yeah. And know the adjacent side is twenty five thousand. You know this height, right? It's a hard line. You know that height. So all we're really interested in is getting this additional height. Now I don't know if that's why they called it. They called it A, and maybe that's for additional height. I don't know. Okay. Well, no. The reason they did, they called this angle A, this angle B, and this angle C, which of course made this the little C. This made this little A. Made this little B. We know little b, we know c, don't we, capital C? They say Amon is saying that uh, the hypotenuse c is 25,000 feet. Oh, wait. Okay, I'm sorry. You're right. That's what they say in the book, too. The distance between it peak and that of the adjacent mountain. So, okay, sorry, I was misreading. Okay, I thought they meant the horizontal distance. That's not what they meant. They meant the actual, as a bird flies, distance. Okay, so the C is the 25,000 feet. How in the world did they know that? Okay, that's not an easy thing to measure. That's an easy thing to measure, at least easier. That would be almost impossible to measure. So that's why I was thinking they knew the distance between the mountains. No, that's not what they meant. Okay? So that's the. Uh, what's that? We're trying to get little a over here. The little b we're not interested in. I thought that's what they gave us, huh? Say again? Okay. Because we know we're looking for this opposite side, which they're calling A, because it's not standing for adjacent. The opposite side over the hypotenuse is sine. So we say sine of 27 degrees is equal to, what were you going to say? Sine of 25, 27 degrees is what? which is A over C, which is 25,000 feet. Okay? I'll put the feet in there. Sometimes they sort of get in the way. So we're looking for A. That's the first step of looking for. Okay? Once we're looking for J, but other than that, it's all right. All right. Now, I believe if you... Hall, that was a bit subtle. Uh, last time we did example two that was on the slide set, but that was not the same as example two that was in the text. So we're on page 328 and uh, example two at the bottom of the page. And unless you have an older book, and then we already did the one that was in that book, then this is a different one. Okay? So we have the setup here. We're first looking for this A right over here. That's the additional height above the 5,000 feet from the first peak. Okay? So how could you solve for A? Multiply both sides by 25,000. Get rid of that denominator. That'll be feet. And multiply this by 25,000. Okay, over here, the 25,000 feet divide out, so your A is equal to 
25,000 times the sine of 27. And anyone get that? Okay, let's say 11,350. Does that sound okay? And really, the way they give these numbers, it looks like all the significance is in the nearest thousand feet. So in a sense, I would even accept 11,000 feet as that age. And then what do we do with that? Add the 5,000 to it to get the height of the second mountain. So you can either say 16,000 feet, or you could say 16,350 feet. Uh, either one of those I would say is fine. And that's what they did. They counted the, the 350, so. Uh, 16,350 feet. Add to that A, which is 11,350 feet. Add to that the 5,000 feet here. And there certainly is not the scale. Thank you so much. So the total height of the mountain would be 16,350 feet. Okay, so that's the answer they were looking for. Does that make sense? All right. So I'll put my feet in here too. All right, there is a checkpoint. I highly recommend you do the checkpoints as soon as you can after class is over so you can... Uh, Move along. Okay. Here's Chris, right? Huh? Chris? Yeah. All right. All right. We just finished the example two in the book. Example two in the slide set we did last time was from the previous edition. Even though the slide set I pulled off of the current, they evidently didn't update the slide set. All right, that done, let's move on to example three if they have it. No, they don't. So we'll go back to where we just were and do example three. Can I erase this one? Yeah or nay? Anyone still writing? Got it? Okay. So let's erase this and do example three. Since they don't have this on the slide set, I, I this was from the other slide set as well. A point 200 feet from the base of a build at a point 200 feet from the base of a building, the angle of right elevation to the bottom of a smoke smokestack is 35 degrees, whereas the angle of elevation to the top is 53, as shown in the figure. So let me see if I can sort of draw the figure. There's the building, and this is the ground level down here, and you are 200 feet from the base of the building, so 200 feet away, you're standing here with a sextant, and you measure the angle to the top of the building. And that angle was 35 degrees. I'll go on down here. 35 degrees is the angle to the bottom of the smokestack that's on the top of the building. Okay? But the smokestack is right here. It goes up to here. And the angle to the top of the smokestack is, this is the total angle from horizontal, angle of elevation, is 53 degrees. This is the angle down here is 35 degrees. 
okay? Uh, find the height of the smokestack alone. So what would be your approach? What would be your approach? How would you go about solving this? Second. Well, we that's what we're looking for is the height of the smoke sack alone. Without the building included. Okay? Yeah. Smoke sack from top of the building to the top of the smoke sack. So in effect, the reason I didn't want to say Yes or no to that. We do need to know the height of the building, but not to answer our question, to be able to get to our question. Okay? So what were you thinking? Find the what? What do you call it? How do you think of it? Just find A and the Okay. Uh, oh, you said the bottom angle? Yeah, okay. In the text, they list the building as being height A, and now I see what you mean. And then they list the smokestack, that height as being height S. Okay? So you're saying find A first. How do we find A? Second? How do we find A? Oh, you do. Okay, 53 will give you all the way to the top of the smokestack. Okay, that will give you to the bottom of the smokestack. What's that? Okay. Now, cosine of 35 degrees, that will give you, given the 200, you can get to the hypotenuse. Okay, I can tell you like to work hard enough. You're a hard worker. And that's admirable. I'm just a little lazier than that. Anyone want to be lazy with me? Uh, how? Uh, how you're lazy? Yeah. How do you want to do it? Here's what I'm looking for. You'll find right here. Here's what I'm looking for. A. I know this and I know the angle. So the question to ask yourself, what relationship relates this angle, 35 degrees, to A and to 200? Fine. You need a tangent. Oh, tangent. That's it. And what's that relationship? Okay, tangent of 35 degrees would be the opposite. And what would be the opposite here? A over the adjacent, which would be 200 feet. All right, I think we can get A then. What would that be? How do we get it? Multiplied by 200 feet, right? Both sides. That wipes out the 200 feet there and leaves us A is equal to 200 times the tangent of 35. Thank you. anything from the book beforehand. Okay. All right. So that gives us A is equal to 200 times the tangent 
of 35 degrees. Okay, and how much would that be? Anyone done it yet? By the way, be sure you're in what mode? Degree, Degree mode, okay. <laughs> what would that give you? The height of A, which is not what we're looking for. One four zero point what? Uh, zero okay, let's just leave it one hundred forty feet. That'll be the height of the building or to the bottom of the smokestack. Then what? <coughs> Say again. Okay. Okay, you're still okay. You like to work hard too. You're still trying to get that hypotenuse. Do we need it? Only if you're going to do a guy wire there and do a slide down the building or something. What do you call those something lines, uh, zip lines? I don't think we are going to do that. I'm not going to do that today. I'm no zip liner myself, so I'm not interested in that hypotenuse. What are we interested in? Yes, S is what we really want. A, we needed to know why. Okay, I couldn't quite hear that, but I'll say it again. Yes, exactly. That's what we're going to do. So, what are we going to subtract it from? Uh, okay, he's back doing signs again. Okay. You want the hypotenuse again, don't you? He loves zip lines, okay? Okay. That would work fine if we knew the hypotenuse, which we don't. We only know that adjacent side. So, it'll be tangent again, and this time it'll be tangent of 53 degrees is equal to what? A plus S. Yes, A plus S over 200 feet, right? And again, we multiply both sides by 200. And these wipe out, and you have A plus S is equal to what? 200 times the tangent of 53 degrees. Yeah, 255.4, so let's just leave it 255 feet. Okay, now that's the total height A plus S. So what do we do now? It's 265 feet. Second? It's 265 feet. 255? 65. 65, I can't hear, okay. 65 feet, okay. And then what do we do with that? Subtract A from this, and A was 140 feet. Okay, so that leaves us S is equal to what? 125 feet. So that's the height of the smokestack. They carried around the 0.4, which I don't think they have legitimate reason to do. Okay. Uh, but you get the general idea. Now, their building may be a bit better to scale than mine. I have my smokestack a little too tall. All right, you see the procedure? I disagree that they can have enough significant digits going into it to get four significant digits out of it, but that's just a minor argument. 125 feet is good for me. 
All right, there is a checkpoint after that one. I would highly recommend you do that. Any questions on this? How we did it, why we did it? Make sense? Okay. Let's move to example four, which also is not in the slide set. So I will, all right, to erase. Okay. Here's example four, finding an angle of depression, okay? A swimming pool is 20 meters long, okay? I'm going to try to draw this a bit more three-dimensional than they did. Okay, there's the top of the pool, and this is a 20-meter length pool, okay? And 12 meters wide. Okay. The bottom of the pool is slanted so that the water depth is 1.3 meters at the shallow end. Okay. Going down to 4 meters at the deep end. Okay. All right. And then it blocks off like this, and there's hidden lines back here and there's a hidden line that goes back there somehow too I'm not going to mess with that okay find the angle of depression in degrees of the bottom of the pool so in other words from the horizontal which there is no real line here but that's what we're using as horizontal this is the angle we're looking at. Uh, what do you want to name it? You can, theta, okay. Everybody's favorite most of the time. What is that angle of depression? In degrees at the bottom of the pool, of the bottom of the pool. Okay. How do we go about doing that? Any suggestions? Okay. Now I put my 20 meters up there. I could have put the 20 meters right here. Or I could have put my 20 meters here. Okay. Tangent theta, you said? Or X, whatever you want to call it. All right. Okay, tangent theta. Is equal to what? Um, opposite over adjacent again. What is your opposite here, though? Huh? No, that's the adjacent to this. Is that four? Four goes from the top to the bottom. So of that angle, what's the opposite? Again, this is 1.3 meters to here. The total is 4, 2.7 meters, yeah, that's the adjacent side. So that's 2.7 meters divided by 20, the adjacent side, meters, okay? Of course, the meters go out because tangents are pure numbers. They don't have units with them, so it's good for the meters, the units to go out. So you have this is equal to, um, you do the math and see what you get. Two point seven divided by twenty. Pretty small number, right? What you get? 0 0.125. 0 0.125. I would leave a lot more digits in this. Everything you've got. That's going to be tangent theta. I'm going to put blah, blah, blah there. Okay. Tangent theta. We want to know what theta is. How do we undo a tangent? How do we undo a tangent? 
hands and say, say again, say again. No, cotangent will reciprocate a can tangent. We're not wanting to reciprocate. We want to undo a tangent. A tangent is a function. Inverse function of tangent. And so we do an inverse tangent on both sides. Tangent to the minus 1 here. And we'll do a tangent to the minus 1 here. So if your calculator or whatever you're using, either you're going to have an ARC uh, TAN or you're going to have an inverse tangent. If you do the inverse tangent of the tangent, you wind up with theta along. That's what we're looking for. Inverse tangent undoes the tangent. And then do the inverse tangent of this. Be sure you're in what mode? Degree mode, because they said in degrees. And see what that will do. Inverse tangent of whatever number you just called out to me. 0.125, blah, 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 blah. Do you still have that on your thing? So check the inverse tangent of it. What do you get as an answer? 7.68, what? 7.688, 4, 4. 4, 4. Let's stop there, okay? Uh, at most, we have two digits, okay? So let's just round that to about 7.7 .7 degrees. I know the book will carry around more digits than that, but you really don't need to. They do 7.69. Okay, fine. Really, I don't think you have justification for more than two digits. Well, this is just barely two digits. You don't know if that zero is significant. That was two digits. How about the 12 meters there? The width of the pool. You know what that's called? Extraneous information. Yeah, it's the width of the pool, but you sure don't need it in this problem. Okay, so do not believe that there's a conservation of data. Okay, that just because they give you a number in a problem doesn't always mean you're going to need the number in the problem. I can remember when I, after um, I got laid off, you know, they shut down our program at Southern Research Institute, and for the next year I was, you know, doing whatever odd jobs I could find because it was a time of progression. And there wasn't much out there, so I was teaching part-time at Duff State, teaching Math 090. And I remember either it was homework or a, a, a quiz or test, there was a question from the test bank. It said, uh, a box of 48 cookies cost $1.19. How much does three boxes cost? Okay. Well... A bunch of the students got it right, but I had an awful lot of them that had the three boxes of cookies costing hundreds of dollars, and I had others that had it costing fractions of a penny because they either multiplied or divided by that 48 because you had to use every number that they gave you. That's the rule, right? No, you don't, okay? The 48 had nothing to do with it. You had three boxes of cookie, $1.19 each. That would be something a little bit more than three bucks, three, three sixty, you know, somewhere around three fifty-seven. That was the answer. But the I was getting fifties and I was getting point fours. You know, none of which made any sense at all. Point oh fours, you know, or something like that, because they thought they had to use that forty-eight cookies somehow in the problem. But no, you don't. Okay. Do you see the tangent key on your calculator? What do you see right above that? Are you on the phone or are you on a connection? Phone, okay. I don't know how it looks on the phone. I think you have to turn your phone sideways to get tangents, don't you? I don't know. What's that? I'm having my own. Okay. Say again? I would try a second. Yeah, that's the second key. What's the second key? What's the 
same with, same with calculators. A Casio is going to look different from a PI, and the you know, I mean, you have to figure out the syntax. We got the same thing the book did. There is a checkpoint there, so I would highly recommend doing that. All right, any questions on this before we move on? Okay. Next, we're going to go to trigonometry and bearings. Okay. Uh, these are not ball bearings, by the way. Okay. These are bearings as in relative to one place, how many degrees before you get to the next place. Okay, that type of thing. Um, so, in surveying and in navigation to uh, situations you run into this, directions can be given in terms of bearings. Now, you have occasionally something you call relative bearing, if you just fit some position and say that's going to be my zero, we're going to do everything based on that. Most of the time it's based on true north, okay? So you have to have a pretty good compass, not a magnetic compass, but a pretty good compass to do that. So a bearing measures the acute angle, notice that, the acute angle that a path or a line of sight makes with a fixed north-south line. So this is pretty different from what we've been doing before. Geometrically, we always use the positive and horizontal axis as our reference line. Now we're either using due north, which is usually up, or due south, which is usually down, as our reference line. Okay. For instance, the bearing south, 35 degrees east. We start looking south and then go to the east, 35 degrees. That's what it means. Start looking at the first letter, south, go 35 degrees toward the east. Okay? That would be this one. So you see it's an acute angle. You wouldn't measure that from the north because that would give you an obtuse angle. So you measure from south 35 degrees toward the east. Okay? What would you say that measure was? How would you read that bearing? This one here. Northwest 80 degrees. Okay, north 80 degrees west. That's how they say it. North 80 degrees west. How about this one? North 45 degrees east. Perfect. Way to go. Okay? So that's how they give these. You start with either north or south, and then how many degrees toward either east or west. Okay? And that will always be an acute angle. Unless it's 90 degrees on the nose, and then you say due east. You don't say that. Okay. All right. So let's do example five. All right. A ship leaves port at noon and heads due west at 20 knots. Does anyone know what a knot is besides what your shoestring sometimes gives you? It's a nautical mile per hour. Does anyone know what a nautical mile is? Okay. Is it any different from a statute mile, which would be a mile on land? Actually, it is. A statute mile is 1,760 yards, or 5,000 I got to see. Oh. Yeah. 5,280 feet. Well, a nautical mile is. Sorry, again. Yeah. 2,000 yards or 6,000 feet. Okay? I don't know why, but they just made it a nice rounded number. So a nautical mile is a little bit longer than a statue. So, you don't need to know that for the problem, just a little bit of information. Okay. At 2 p.m., that was at, at, at noon, they left port traveled due west at 20 knots, which is 20 nautical miles per hour. At 2 p.m., the ship changes its course to north 54 west. So it changes to north 
54 west. No, I'm due west here, north 54 west here. Okay? Now, find the, it's shown below, find the ship's bearing and distance from the port of departure at 3 p.m. So one hour later. Okay? So the two hours it went due west at 20 knots, which is 20 nautical miles per hour, two hours, that would be 40 nautical miles. Then it went to north 54 west and traveled that way for one more hour from 2 to 3 at 20 nautical miles knots, which is 20 nautical miles per hour. So it traveled 20 nautical miles there. So what we want to know is the ship's bearing, which is going to be given as north so many degrees west, right? Okay, that's where it is. And distance from the port. Well, distance from the port is going to be the sea distance here, right? So we're going to need to know that. And we just ignore the seagulls, okay? And the eels that are way, way, way up. Okay. So how are we going to calculate? Uh, and I want to say it doesn't matter which you do first, but I think it probably would be helpful to do the distance first and then worry with the, the band. So how do we determine the distances first? They've given you a pretty big hint here without telling you they did. They named two angles here. The first angle is A, B, D, which is not a right angle, obviously. And the second angle is A, C, D, which is a right angle. Okay? Now, the data they gave you pertains to A, B, D, okay? Well, the one that we really want to know is A, C, D, because from that you can measure the distance, and from that you can also measure the amount, okay? Here go with this. So, the one we know, we know this length. And we know that length. What we need to know is the total horizontal length, the west length, and the total north length. How can we get that? So we need to know D and C. We, okay. Right, all of the north and south axes. Okay. When you say D, that's just a point. No, I mean, oh, oh wait, you mean the little D. Oh, D and B. Is that what you mean? Yeah, the little piece of these. That's exactly what we need. You're absolutely right. How do we get those? Cosine of angle C, because C is 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 we know to be zero. Right? So that's not the angle we're interested in. So it'd be 20, it'd be D over 20, right? Yes, D over, over 20 over. will be the cosine of what? C is the 90 degrees. That's that's not, a, you know, we don't ever use that. We use one or two acute. Okay. Now, here's the issue, and this, this is the part that gets a little funky. If you're using this triangle here, B, C, D, then you're interested in this angle. So you just can you subtract 54 from 90 to find that angle? Yes. That's one way. 
other way is look up here. This is the alternate interior angle you learn. So you know this one is 54 degrees. So you can do it that way. But one of those two ways you got to do. Okay? You choose either use this angle here, which is the complementary angle to that one, or you use the angle up here, which is the same as that one. And I don't care which one. Huh? Okay, we're going to use angle D. So, um, what we're doing is trying to get the measurement D. Is that right? Or measurement B? You say. D, little d. Okay. So, how does, and, and this angle here, I'll go ahead and draw it in here. This is also 54 degrees. Do you see why that's true? These are parallel lines here, and that's a transect across them, so the alternate interior angle are the same. Okay? So, what can you tell me about the relation between 54 that we know, D that we're looking for, and what is the one other thing we know? Hypotenuse. Okay, so now we're back to one you like, right? What would that be? Sine. The sine of 54 degrees will be D over 20. And that's 20 nautical, nautical miles. Okay? So, what would D be? How do you solve for D? Multiply both sides by 20 nautical miles. Itchy nose. 20 nautical miles. Okay. Those wipe out here. So, 20 times sine of 54 is... Fifteen point one eight. Let's just. I want to just call that fifteen miles. Can we just call it fifteen miles? I know the book is going to do probably a lot of digits too. Okay, fifteen miles. You don't want to call it sixteen. Oh, what did you say? It was sixteen point. Oh, sixteen point one. I can't hear. Okay, sorry. Okay, the old deaf guy here. Okay, sixteen miles. Nautical miles. Okay. All right, so now we know our full length AC, that would be your 40 plus 16, so that full length there is 56 nautical miles. Okay, so that gives you that length. What else do you need? Little b. Now how will you get that one? With which? With the uh, this, that, and that. Yeah, absolutely. That's one way you can do it. Um, or the cosine of 54 would be d over 20, adjacent over our hypotenuse, and that would certainly do well too. Now, here's the only reason I like that approach more than this one. Remember, we rounded off here. So this number was a round off number. Whichever, however long you want it, hang on to it. It's a round off number. This is using exactly what was given. So there's no round off involved. Okay? Except whatever they had initially, and we have to live with that whatever. So that would be the only advantage. You should get very close to the same answer. So what do you get for D? One way would be. Uh, B is equal to 20 nautical miles times the cosine of 54 degrees. The other way was doing Pythagorean theorem. Which I got 18, 7, what did you say? I got 11. Oh. 27, okay. Let's just call that 12. Is that okay? Nautical miles. That makes more sense. This is 12 nautical miles. This D was 16 nautical miles. Okay. So now we can go to find C. Now this way, if you've been wanting, waiting to do a Pythagorean theorem, this one's got to be it. Uh, yeah. 
no way around this one. So it is 12 squared plus 56 squared is equal to 16. Right? So I know that is 144. I can't do 56 squared in my head. So I'll leave that to you. Add those two squared numbers together and then take the square root and what do you get? Twelve squared plus fifty-six squared equal what something and then take the square root of that. Right? Side down there, a squared, even though technically that wouldn't be a great name for it. But a squared plus b squared equals c squared, so a squared plus b. Say again? 57.21. 57.21. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That sounds reasonable to me. I'm going to say approximately 57 nautical miles. The reason is that such a small, small side here compared to a long side there is going to be just a little bit. That makes perfect sense. So now we've got the distance from home from the point of departure. Let's get our bearing from the point of departure. From the point of departure, the ship is the boat is here, so the bearing is north so many degrees west. It's not the bearing of the port from where you are, that would have been north so many degrees, no, south so many degrees east. So they said from the point of departure, so it's from port A. So we've got to get that angle. How do we do that? Which angle? The one we're interested in is this one, but there's not going to be an easy way to do that. I don't think it could be. Uh, if you use this angle here, that would be the same as this angle here. Uh, and you know everything you need to do for that. sides I would use there. If you did this one, I would use B and this one. Well, at least you had something that was already there. So I would do the inverse tangent of 56 and 12. That's one way to I think that's probably the best way. Well, this it involves at least two round offs to get there. This one is one, well, it's two round offs, two. So that one had three round offs, too. So. If you use this angle, knowing this angle is the same as that angle, that's the one you're really interested in. Uh, The tangent of this angle here is equal to 56 over 12. Then get what the arc tangent of that is. What you get? Second. Okay. Now, here's the angle we're really interested in. Okay. Now that the corresponding angle inside our triangle would be this one, right? Because these, again, be alternate interior angles of these two parallel lines here, the vertical lines here, and there's your transect. So if you get this one, now that's not 54 degrees, that's this one. So the, what do you want to call this one? Theta, all right. So this angle here we'll call theta, and we'll say the tangent of theta is equal to the opposite side, 56 nautical miles, divided by the adjacent side, which is 
12 nautical miles. Sorry, we're not using our hypotenuse, okay? We could, but that was a calculated measurement. This was also, but didn't use, use fewer calculations to get there. So that gives you something that's on the order of four point something another, and then do the inverse tangent of that, and you'll get the angle theta. 56 divided by 12, and then do the inverse tangent of that number. Okay, so this angle theta here, about 78 degrees. He's got 7.9. So the bearing would be what? Of the ship from the point, port. How would you give it? Okay, you start with either, yeah, north, 78 degrees west. Perfect. Okay. Let's see what they got. They got 57.5 nautical miles. That's because they rounded off twice. Okay. And they got the... Wait a minute. Who did they get? I am trying to find what they got. Oh, there it is. They got north 7820. 78.20. We got 78. I think that's close enough. North 78 degrees west. Good deal. They went about it a little bit different way. I think it was a little longer and possibly more calculations. I think we sort of mineralized those so we had fewer round off errors. But all right. There is a checkpoint there, bottom of the page. I would certainly do that before I got too deeply into, uh, too long away from class. Okay. What's that? Five minutes left. Okay, let's see what we got. Oh, here's how they did it. They started by doing, like you were suggesting, finding that angle B, which is 90 minus 54, rather than using angle D, which was 54. Either way works. So this way they're using a sine, whereas we use cosine, because the uh, complement, the complement, the Complement of an angle is the complementary, yeah, you know, that saying, I can't get it right in my head. So 20 times the sine of 36 degrees uh, will give you your B, and I think we did 20 times the cosine of 54 degrees. And then the D was 20 times the cosine of 36, which we did 20 times the sine of 54. Get the same results. Um, now, rather than writing down the numbers, they carry along all that. So tangent of A is B over D plus 40, which we had already calculated. But they do it this way. Rather than saying measuring B, they do 20 sine 36 divided by 20 cosine 36 plus 40 which to me is a little more complicated way to write it. We did the same thing, but we just went on and got our numbers earlier. And they got about uh, 0 0.209, and then they took the arctangent of that, and that gave us the angle. Why in the world did they go to radians? I do not know. Everything else is in degrees. Now they do, do the radians and calculate degrees. Crazy way to do it. 
They got 11.82. We got 12, didn't we? Well, we didn't actually do it this way. So that gave them 11.82. Then they have to subtract that from 90 to get the complementary angle and got to 78.18, which we got 78. So yeah, we got the same result by going a slightly different way, but everything was consistent. Okay? So the bearing is north 78 degrees west. Exactly what we got. Now, to get the C, oh boy, they said that was B divided by sine A. Uh, yeah, the sine A was that 12 degrees that they had, and the B was the measured thing. So you see they're using two calculated values here to get the C. Uh, so that was 20 sine 36 divided by sine of 11.82. And that gave about 57.4 nautical miles, distance from point. We said 57 right on the money. It's funny, in the book, they said 57.5 nautical miles. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know how they did the same calculation in the book and on here and got different, slightly different number, but it's ever so slight. All right, so do we have time for a harmonic motion? One minute. Okay, let me give you some homework assignments here. So let me first mark my place so I won't be lost next time. Okay, and we will be right there with harmonic motion. And really have very little left in the ch uh, section, just uh, one page and two examples. So homework exercises here, do any of the odds 5 through 11, they're all at calcchat.com, um, 9 is at calcview.com. Do any of the, uh, either 13 or 15, they're both at Calc Chat, uh, 15's at Calc View. Do any of the odds 17 through, goodness gracious, wow, 43. Any of the odds 17 to 43, they're all at Calc Chat, none of those are at Calc View. And we'll stop there and pick up harmonic motion next time. Now. As an extra bonus, because y'all are such great people, I did bring in the uh, the second test. So if you want the second test to get a jump on it, you can have it. Uh, after we finish this, then you'll have a full week uh, to do it. So this gives you a little bit longer than a week. So if any of you want that before you leave, I'll be glad to get it. Home. What's that? The second test is on this, right? I can't hear you. The second test is on this. Oh. 4.5 to 4.9, uh, 4.8. 4.5 started with the graphing, remember? Okay, so you'll need some graph paper. Do you need graph paper? Do you have some? Do you need graph paper? There's nine to graph. Do you need graph paper? I've got some if you need it. you need graph paper? Do you need graph paper? First nine to graph, and after that you answer the questions and solve problems. Don't worry about number twenty. We haven't gotten there yet. Okay. So the first the rest of those. The first thing needs to be done before we take. What that? The first thing needs to be turned in by. Uh, as soon as you can. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. Just give me a second. Uh, I can have the first one back as soon as we can get it. Come on. So do that first before you do that.